Ja, guten Tag, herzlich willkommen im Goethe-Institut in Rabat. Ähm, ich freue mich sehr und fühle mich sehr geehrt, dass wir hier der Beginn dieser weltweiten Lernreise Bauhaus Imaginista Learning From sind hier in Rabat in Marokko. Das hat bestimmte Gründe, zu denen werden Sie im Laufe des Abends noch ganz viel erfahren, hoffe ich. Donc merci, bienvenue. Et elle est particulièrement contente de vous accueillir pour le lancement de ce cycle. En fait, c'est un programme mondial qui va avoir lieu dans plusieurs pays. Et le lancement a lieu au Maroc ce soir avec un premier chapitre qui s'appelle Bauhaus Imaginista Learning From. Besonders freue ich mich natürlich über die Anwesenheit von Kader Atia, von Marion von Osten und von Hugh Grant hier im Goethe-Institut in Rabat. Das ist eine ganz große Ehre. Ich hoffe, wir können alle von Ihrer Anwesenheit ganz toll profitieren. Und ich hoffe, dass wir einen interessanten Diskurs hier heute Abend bekommen. Alors je traduis pour ceux qui ne comprendraient pas encore l'allemand. Donc c'est un véritable honneur pour nous et pour le Goethe Institut Marocco d'accueillir ce soir Kader Atia, Marion von Osten et Grant Watson et surtout aussi d'avoir la possibilité d'offrir au public de Rabat un espace pour la discussion et pour un discours conceptuel sur l'art, c'est aussi très important pour le Goethe Institut. Wir setzen diese Veranstaltung dann später fort mit der Eröffnung der Forschungsausstellung im Raum Le Cup. Und äh, morgen für einige der Anwesenden mit einem Workshop ebenfalls im Le Cup. Und deswegen darf ich auch unsere Partnerin Elisabeth Piskernik vom Le Cup ganz herzlich begrüßen. Bah ouais, Imaginista, House Imaginista, c'est pas seulement cette discussion ce soir. Il va y avoir à l'issue de ces discussions un vernissage d'une exposition présentant les recherches de Kader Atia et uh, co-curatée par uh, Maud Doucet. Et on remercie particulièrement uh, Elisabeth Pistoning et son équipe du Cube pour ce partenariat uh, très riche et très réussi. Donc après, à, je précise, ça je ne traduis pas, j'ajoute, mais à 19h, donc on pourra aller tous ensemble à pied uh, au Cube qui est à 10 minutes uh, d'ici, comme uh, vous le savez, uh, les rabattis. Uh, et il y avait une autre... Je suis peut-être oublié quelque chose, je ne sais plus. <rire> ah oui, j'ai oublié. J'ai oublié de mentionner le workshop. Alors ça, ce n'est pas ouvert au public, mais c'est important aussi. C'est un projet de recherche. Et donc demain, euh, occupe toujours, euh, il y aura une équipe de chercheurs et d'artistes qui se réuniront autour euh, de Kader Atia et des curateurs du projet euh, pour aussi continuer les discussions et euh, entretenir ces échanges. C'est aussi très important de, de le dire. Viel Vergnügen und uns allen ein erfolgreiches Lernen. Vielen Dank. Je cède la parole à Grant Watson, qui est un des curateurs de Bauhaus Imaginista. So, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, and first of all, I want to thank um, Suzanne Baumgart and Celine Lebret and the team at the Goethe Institute for hosting us and also Elizabeth Pistonik from The Cube. We're really grateful that you are accommodating us in your wonderful gallery. Um, and particularly to Maud Husseis for her research on this project, and last but not least, Kada Atia. Um, I also want to apologize for not speaking French or Arabic. I'm going to speak in English, and I'm aware that some people won't be able to follow what I say. So before we move on to talk about the research which um, Maud and Marion and Kada have been working on here in, in, in Morocco, I want to say just a few things about the overall Bauhaus Imaginista project. So as you all know, in 2019, the Bauhaus is going to be 100 years old, and Marion and myself have been given the honor, I would say, of marking that occasion with a large-scale project um, which is going to reflect on the legacy of the Bauhaus in the intervening 100 years. So, of course, this is a very um, large question, how to address this legacy. Maybe to say a few things about our background. 
Uh, we both come from a contemporary art background, so we principally working with artists, hence collaborations with artists such as Kada. Um, but we also, in our work as curators, have dealt with the so-called applied arts, um, decorative arts, and also, I think, with historical material, often bringing the contemporary art and the applied art and the historical into a relationship. So this is how we approach Bauhaus Imaginista. It's not, it's not uh, specifically an art historical project. It has a slightly different uh, approach. The other thing to say is that we uh, are working with an international frame. So I think given the developments that have happened in the last two decades or so in relation to curating, um, any project of this scale would have to think beyond the confines of a European um, construct. And that's the case for Bauhaus Imaginista. And in fact, uh, we were commissioned by the Bauhaus and the other partners in the project to not think exclusively about the years between 1919 and 1933 when the Bauhaus was active as a school, but to think about the international relations that the Bauhaus had um, during that time and also an international reception history um, that has followed on in the intervening 100 years. But I suppose the question for us was to think about um, what is the benefit of this approach, a kind of globalized approach? How can we avoid thinking in sort of um, maybe too generalized terms and overextending the, the, the remit of our project? Uh, how can we work in a way that is relating to the particularities of specific histories? Um, and one of the ways that we've thought about this is to think in terms of case studies. So we look at maybe something like 10 different geographic um, case studies. And in each region, we work with curators. So here we work with Maud. We have curators in um, other parts of the world who are developing particular pieces of research for us. And so I think in the, by this approach, we, we hope to um, maybe bore down a little bit more intensively into uh, specific case studies, but also ultimately to think about how these different histories relate to one another. And I think this is one of the really interesting aspects of our research is when we come and do work research in Morocco, we also do research um, in Brazil from the similar period, and we think about what are the parallels and how do these connect back to the Bauhaus. So the question I think which you might be asking at this point is how do you choose these particular case studies? Um, how beyond our own interests as curators do we decide which schools to look at, which geographies to look at, which works of art, which works of craft and design? And when we were beginning our conversation, the two of us as curators, we quite quickly came up with this device which was to <clears throat> select four objects as starting points. So these objects in German are called Gegenstand, which is, uh, sorry? Hmm? Oh, click. Please click. Who's clicking? Is that me? Ah, yes. So the four objects uh, which will be appearing on the screen. Um, and these objects, maybe to say, before we go into those objects, maybe to say something about the character of those objects. So one thing about them is that each object has a kind of ephem ephemeral ca character. It's something which is, to a certain extent, incomplete, something which leads on to something else, something which suggests a legacy. So three of the objects are works on paper, and one of them is an ephemeral light projection. So the first object, unsurprisingly, is the Bauhaus Manifesto from 1919, written by Walter Gropius. And the image that you can see on the screen behind is of the finding a lino print of a cathedral, which was shown on the opposite page of the text of the manifesto. Click. The second... Um, Gegenstand is a, a collage by Marcel Breuer, and it's a 
a, a fake advert that was published in the Bauhaus Journal. And it's a film strip, so it's the, it's the fake advert for a film. And it shows a series of chairs that were designed by Breuer, um, in two of them in collaboration with Gunther Sturzel. And it sort of projects the idea of the design of the chair into the future. So you can, if you can see the image, you have a... Sorry? So if you can see the image um, from where you sit, you can see that there are a series of dates, 1921, 1921, 1924, 1925, and then 19, question mark, question mark. So it's Marcel Breuer thinking about where does the design of the chair go? And then the, th the, the third Gegenstand is a reflective light game that was produced by Kurt Schwertfeger in 1922, so from an earlier period of the Bauhaus. And this was a, this was a, a mechanism that uh, Schwertfeger created um, that would project colored light. And it was shown in the context of the lantern party at the Bauhaus. And it was installed in the apartment of Vasily Kandinsky. And the final Gegenstand is the carpet by Paul Clay. It's a small drawing from 1927. And this is the subject of the chapter which we're looking at in this context, which is called Learning From. So where do these Gegenstands take us? Um, the first Gegenstand, which is the manifesto, is obviously a document about education and pedagogy and also about institution building. But for us, I think it was really important not to think about the Bauhaus as, a, as the original school or the only school of its kind um, that was being established at that time. And so in our chapter, we think about the um, Bauhaus manifesto as a, um, as a text which is maybe similar to other texts which were being produced by schools, for example, in Asia. So in this chapter, we look at a school in India called Kalabhavan, which was established by Rabindranath Tagore in the same year as the Bauhaus, in the August of 1919. And we also look at a school called Saikatsu Kozai Ken Kyojo, and I think our Japanese researcher would probably reprimand me for my pronunciation. But this was a school that was set up in 1931 um, by um, Renshichiro Kawakita, who was a Japanese architect. And so what's interesting to think about with these schools is both their relationship to the Bauhaus, so they were connected to the Bauhaus more or less, but also a kind of common cause, which was to do with turning to art education, art and design education, as a way to produce a radical break with the past. And they were linked through what you might call an early 20th century avant-garde, which had a kind of international dimension to it. So to maybe, to maybe I mentioned briefly the carpet because it's up on the screen. So the carpet, as I think we will go on to discuss in more detail in the next couple of days, is a drawing uh, by Paul Clay from 1927. And it refers in part, I think, to Paul Clay's very significant travel to Tunis in 1914, the, the impact that that journey had on his practice. But it also refers to the relationship that Paul, had, uh, Paul Clay had between 1923 and 1927, which was a very intense relationship with the weaving workshop. So this, of course, is a textile, um, and many of Paul Clay's drawings from this period have this textile-like quality. But it also points to an interest at this time, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, in works from outside of the modernist mainstream. So um, works from uh, the Near East, from Asia, from North Africa, from the Americas, um, Oceania. And in what we found as part of our research is that in the, in the early uh, Weimar library, there are a series of books of so-called world art, um, including books on African sculpture, ancient Mexican art, Indian tribal art of the West Coast, 
and Peruvian textiles. <clears throat> but what was interesting, I think, about this appropriation that took place at the Bauhaus um, of these materials from other cultures was that they were significantly used as a way to innovate within contemporary German culture, and they were used to develop, for example, prototypes um, that could go into commercial production. So there was a, a pragmatic aspect to this rather than it simply being about a form of self-expression. If you could flip, flip back. Um, <clears throat> Speeding up slightly, because I think I have to. I have to. Uh, moving away, this is the, um, as you can see, as I said, this collage has this element of evolution to it, the idea of the evolution of design, the very rapid evolution of design, in that these dates are very close together. And one thing that Breuer wrote in 1928 is that we live in a time of rapid change and that design needs to continuously evolve to meet those changes. So in a way, a kind of counter to the notion of a universal Bauhaus prototype. And in this chapter, we look at the instrumental use of design and its relationship to um, governance, to idealism, to development projects, um, to big political projects like the establishment of uh, Soviet Union, uh, architectural projects in relation to planned cities. Also in post-independence India, we look at design as a tool uh, a development tool that was used in rural areas, but also um, in the uh, growing of the Indian economy. Um, and finally, the Kurt Schwertfeger, which is, yep. So this, as I said, is a, um, a work that was developed for a party situation. So it's in fact the opposite of an, instrumental, an, instrum an instrumentalization of aesthetics. And in this uh, chapter, we think about a, a suggested legacy of this work, which connects to um, expanded cinema um, in, for example, in the new Bauhaus in Chicago, um, the meeting of art and technology that took place in MIT, different departments in MIT, and also to the sphere of popular culture and those innovations that happened in electronic music in the 80s and 90s. So those are our four chapters. And I'll just also quickly run through the program. So this is the first um, event of the year program for 2019. Um, next week, we are going to China, and we're setting up an exhibition at the China Design Museum in Hangzhou. Um, and that opens on the 7th of April. And that exhibition relates to the chapter moving away. So it looks at these histories of design from India and, and Soviet Union and China. Um, and then in June, we have a workshop in New York, which is connected to this workshop. And so some of the ideas which are discussed in the next couple of days will be translated to the American context, where we look much more at weaving and, and fiber art. In August, we have an exhibition in Kyoto, um, which is the, relating to the chapter corresponding with. And this will look at the three schools, the Bauhaus, Kalabavan, and the Japanese school. And in September, we have an exhibition at the garage in Moscow, which again is moving away. And this is looking particularly at the um, architects, the Bauhaus architects who went to the Soviet Union in the 1930s. In September, we have an exhibition at Sesc Pompeii in Sao Paulo, which again connects to this chapter, Learning From. And then we have a, a, a seminar in Lagos, and finally, a symposium in Delhi, which is relating to the corresponding with. All of this information is available on our website, which will be launched next week. So it's a lot to take in, but I think there's more explanation there. And so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Marion, who will talk in more detail about the uh, learning from chapter. Thank you. Thank 
Okay, first of all, all my thanks to everybody who made this possible. We had already thanks from uh, Grant, but it's really an honor also for us to be here. And especially for me, I have to say, there's really a long trajectory that I have with research in Morocco. And it's something like of a very long wish come true because it was kind of a time when I was in investigating uh, and exploring the Souf magazine, where I had the idea that there was something going on with the artist from the Casablanca School and the Bauhaus. And it was only an intuition, and it's very interesting that now we are standing here uh, and have also through the big help of Motu Saiz and her uh, amazing protocol, um, suddenly a body of work. And this also, this kind of body of work also relates to conversations that we conducted together with Tony Maraini, uh, with Abdelatif Labi, uh, with Mohamed Melehi, uh, with uh, whom else? A lot of people <laughs> from that kind of generation with the Balkaya Foundation. So we were really kind of trying to track and it was amazing that in the moment when we were starting to speak, how openly everybody said, yes, for sure we related to the Bauhaus. For sure we related to Gropius curriculum. And uh, because there was an attempt to combine and to resynthesize the arts, which actually had been divided through French colonial occupation. Um, but French of colonial occupation meant also the Academy of Beaux-Arts. And it's actually uh, not that I was trained in the Academy of Beaux-Arts, but I also had to start to think for myself as a curator and artist, because I was also a trained artist, that I was trained in a specific form of the division of the arts, in a division of high and low, in a division of applied and non-applied, which was actually a legacy, not only of a bourgeois society, but also of the colonial modern. And it is this kind of history of the colonial modern that I'm quite interested in, and which I already collaborated with Kader Atia several years ago, where he also, Kader, showed that uh, the colonial modern also meant that this kind of French so-called protectorates or the uh, colonial spaces like uh, Algeria were also testing ground for urban developments, but as well as kind of inspiration, as we say, for architects like Le Corbusier, who were looking at the material culture of um, building, uh, of vernacular buildings, of um, crafts, practices, and so on. But we don't need to forget, I mean, that also through colonialism, there was an intervention into the guilds, into the crafts, and there was also a specific perspective that people who came then visiting these territories, like Paul Klee, which I will talk about in a minute, uh, had kind of already a frame how to look at things. You know? So there was, for sure, oriental studies, and there was categorizations by the uh, colonial officials and by forms of education. Um, so what does it mean actually now for us with all this knowledge of today, because this is a contemporary, as, as Grant clearly said, this is a contemporary curator's position, that we think in relation, that we think transnationally, that we think transculturally. What does it mean then to, to look at this drawing again and what does it actually say to us? On the one hand, and maybe we can um, have the first slide, it says, no, um, yeah, okay, no, no, <laughs> the other way around, oh, no, the other way around, okay, here, no, yeah, here we are. So this is, uh, we, we could actually direct it clearly to his travel to Tunisia, to this canonic travel in 1914. Many modernist artists went into the Maghreb and were studying crafts as to develop a new language of abstraction, point. They did it under colonial rule, point. But there is something else in this kind of interest. So in 1910 already, um, he was interested in the decorative arts. So Paul Klee made drawings from ornaments which are coming from different sources. It's not just like Orientalist readings. So there was an idea of the modernist artist in overcoming the division of the high and low. So there was something which was decorative art, was feminine, was minor, was not art, was actually not this kind of heroic statement of male artists. Should we go on? And then for sure they also traveled, but Clay actually was hesitant. He did not want to, to go to Tunisia. Everybody was, Vasily Kandinsky was already, he did not really like. He was actually also an ill person. He was always 
not very well in his whole life. So it was not something that he really did want. So he, they went there and they stayed in the colonial part of Tunis in the house of Dr. Yegi, who was a Swiss psychoanalyst, which is interesting for Kader. And he stayed there and so almost did not go out. So the others are out going and studying, and, but Clay stayed in this home and had only kind of an imaginary of what actually maybe this kind of uh, society or what was the production about. And we have these rare photos of August Macke where we see him out here, he's on the donkey. This is Paul Clay on the donkey in the front of the traditional town of uh, Tunis. And maybe the next one. And it's also interesting that we don't find any kind of carpets or in his collections. I went to the Paul Klee Center and asked them, because they are all the specialists sit on Paul Klee, if they found in his collection and carpets or materials that he collected maybe from the Tunis travel. And the only thing that was found was this anonymous painter drawing. There are three drawings in his collection which actually depict a city in a two-dimensional way, which is quite interesting because it's actually, on the one hand, very beautiful, very crafty, very, very delicate. And then, you, next one, you see what he does with it. There's a whole series of works, when you think about his works, where he starts to test out uh, this kind of drawing. So it's not something which he takes from kind of a landscape painter having the atmosphere of the city, but actually it is already an artifact that he relates to by an anonymous painter. And I think this question of the anonymous painter and how this translates into a high modernist artist in the end is a question that we definitely have to tackle in our chapter when it is about learning from. So who learns from whom, what is concealed, who are the actors and practitioners that we don't see anymore when you know, something is transformed into another art form. And then there is for sure a carpet, but he calls it carpet of memory. So he does not say this is, this is 1914 again. He's not claiming that this is a real carpet. He's saying that's kind of my memory. And uh, the Paul Klee Center made a whole um, exhibition around this carpet of memory because it's definitely interesting to think about the imaginative potential of the artist. And it's also somehow relating to our title, Bauhaus Imaginista, we are not speaking about the Bauhaus just in the truth value of what it did or not. We don't know really. I mean, for sure, a lot of people try to claim it, that there is something like a truth, what it was. But for us, it's much more interesting what they had imagined as a new society with this school. And I think there was also something to imagine when he was imagining this kind of carpet of memory, which was for sure a radical break with figuration and also an orientalist tradition. So it's this kind of ambivalence where we also have to read. It's not something which we can easily put into the primi primitivist discourse. You know? So it's much more complex. The next one. The next thing is when you would have this one and back and forth, this is a carpet from the Bert Flint collection in Marrakesh, you would also see that there was memory of for sure original carpets, um, but they were <coughs> abstracted and put into something else. And this is also an amazing finding in the Paul Klee Center. I was asking, but when he was in the weaving faculty of the Bauhaus, did he really study carpets, was there something that we could see in this drawing of the carpet from 1927 that we could find in his teaching and said, no, he never did. It was very much on formal languages, on the way in which you use color, as in the Bauhaus. It was not taught how to paint. It was actually a language how to deal with tensions on or with, with possibilities of Gestaltung, which is not really design, so uh, uh, some kind of tensions. And but then I found in one of his students, Lena uh, Lena Bergner, who was then later married with Hannes Meyer, she actually studied in his course also traditional carpets. So they were actually really studying from very different sources. Maybe you go on. And this is now connecting us back to Morocco and this kind of question of sources and also kind of a rupture in language. When in the uh, Kazakh school, which also you will speak about, um, there was a break with the academic tradition because of the colonial legacy, because of the division of the arts. 
also to throw away the Greek caste, the Roman castes, and also the copy tradition that you had in the Academy, uh, in the Beaux-Arts tradition, and also to then hang carpets or look at jewelry, I mean, of uh, the uh, local crafts production, and also study it. And I think that's actually the whole chapter about. It's precisely on a very historical, but also still very actual question on artistic research. So artistic research could also mean to look into the techniques on the way in which things have been worked out. And here it's interesting, you see on the one hand, this is from Maghreb Art Magazine, published in uh, 65 uh, from the Ecole uh, uh, the, uh, Casablanca, and a study of the students. We go on. I, I will, this is Maghreb Art, this is from 65 and 66, and here you already see you know, the references. I have to, to be a little bit faster. This is again also from uh, Bert Flynn's collection in Marrakesh, where you also see elements in Clay's work, but you also see this kind of how it is studied in the moment of um, 10 years after Morocco's independence again. Here is a pedagogical brochure of the L'Ecole de Casablanca, which also Maud will speak about. And this is in the private archive from uh, Tony Marin, Marin, because it is very hard to really track down the original material. Um, it's somehow a little bit a lost history, and we will today have also a great scholar who has also worked on that uh, legacy. So it's very interesting to see as well the um, original material that we definitely want to show in Sao Paulo in Berlin. Go on. So um, what actually are the questions that we have? Maybe we go on. And uh, go on. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe here. There's also, also the article in the Integral magazine that was also published by Melehi and by uh, Tony Maraini here, uh, a text by Tony Maraini uh, on their meeting with uh, Herbert Bayer in Tanger, who actually also had an apartment there, and they were in uh, meeting in Mexico and were in friendship. But maybe just to go to our questions that we have. So one question is how would we actually look today on craft objects, on handicraft objects, or on objects that have been done in a very different way than maybe contemporary art is produced today. So what about this kind of material culture and this object culture, which for a long time was denied? And I think Grant and me have here a similar interest also to rethink it as a possibility to um, think what we could learn from it, what would be the possibility for thinking through contemporary art. And one problem is that will be raised by Kader Atia today is that these kind of objects have been completely abstracted from their function and from their social meaning. And uh, this was definitely through specific forms of museum display. So they are abstracted from the, so the social and physical body, as Kada Atia says. But they also have been re-read, and they were also not original or native objects. They were in themselves already transculturations. So there is something which is about the uh, Verwandlung, what is actually a German word, which I much more like than uh, the French word, detournement. I like this work. I don't know if Verwandlung is something that we could even translate in, in French. Transformation, it's not so nice in Verwandlung. With Verwandlung, there is something, there is something in, in the word which is uh, much nicer about it. It's because it's, it's as if there would be a trick, you know, it's something like a magician uh, would actually do something. Because, yeah, metamorphose. Um, and this metamorphose does mean that there is something happening which is unexpected. Because you could think about Clay as an Orientalist coming um, to the Maghreb, but then there is a detournement in his own work, and it is actually has a lot of references. And then there is something appearing which nobody would have expected, that in fact the Gropius curriculum was read by artists here in the post-independence moment, which was unexpected, it was nothing. We could also question why Gropius, why the Bauhaus, definitely because he had to fly from the Nazis, so it was not this kind of 
uh, heroic modernism, which was a French modernism like Le Corbusier, but it was also because of the synthesis of the arts. And when we think about decolonizing culture today, I think we have to come back also to this kind of point where was a split in our institutions, in our epistems, how we were separated from this kind of histories which actually do belong together. And with this, I would like to give you the word, Imod. 